Well, good morning. I said yesterday in my sermon that this was a hard one to give, especially given the fact that I had to condense what I had to say to under 15 minutes and recognising that there would be children present. But I think the hardest thing about this passage in particular, Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48, is that it isn't immediately compatible with my ideas about justice. I see someone wronged, I think justice needs to be done. I get wrong myself and I expect justice to come quickly and by the hand of myself or someone else. We want a just and fair society because we all know the rules of the game and we can expect everyone to play fairly because everyone recognises that there are consequences when we don't. There is a standard, if you like, for how we expect people to live and behave. And when that standard isn't met, uh, we expect justice and a penalty. So when Jesus talks in this passage about evil people and enemies, uh, for us it seems natural and right that we should talk about justice and punishment. After all, we believe in a God of justice. And in a way, we are entirely right. We're entirely right to expect evildoers to be punished and for our enemies to be brought to justice. The truth that we often don't recognise though, is that even we can be evil. We can be someone's enemy. And this is what Jesus says a little later on in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 verses 9 to 11. Jesus says this, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now remember, Jesus is speaking only to his disciples at this point, and it's them, his disciples, that he calls evil. That's quite hard to accept, isn't it? We think of ourselves as good, don't we? Uh, as deserving God's love and mercy. Sure, I do bad things, but come on, I haven't killed anyone. But if I've gotten this far into Jesus' sermon and am still thinking this way, then I've probably missed the whole point of it. You see, the danger is that we read something like, do not murder, and think, great, I've ticked that one off again today. Now, me, I'm just over 35 years old. So for me, that's nearly 13,000 day streak of perfect obedience to this law not to murder. But Jesus says that anger and belittling people will bring me under his judgment and will make me in danger of the fires of hell. You see, before God, there is no one righteous, not one. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the standard God has set. Sin is anything that's against God and anything below God's standard of goodness is the opposite of good. It's evil. And so when I look at my own heart and my own thoughts, my lifestyle, my 13,000 day streak of obedience quickly crumbles to a couple of minutes and that's on a super good day. I had a principal at Bible college, a man named Mike Ovi, who died a few years ago. And Mike used to always talk about his sin and he'd remind us as a college regularly how sinful we were in chapel. And this made for quite uncomfortable listening, especially when you looked around and realised that you're sitting in a chapel full of ministers in training. If there was anyone who should be striving for sinlessness and righteousness, it was this bunch of men and women. But when he was asked why he was always so open and strong about sin, Mike would say the most beautiful thing. Mike would say that the more aware he was of his own sin, of his depravity, that's a, an old word we used to use, the more sweeter the grace given to him by Jesus would taste. Because Mike came to a newer and deeper understanding of his own wickedness against God, or someone else God had made, he would realise that even that wasn't too much for the blood of Jesus to wash him clean of. Because Mike was so sure of his salvation that he knew no matter how much more pitiful he came to realise he was before his creator, he found his creator's love for him to be even greater than that. 
Mike knew that the lowest level of sin he could sink to wasn't beyond the reach of his saviour Jesus, who left his glorious throne in heaven to plunge himself down into Mike's muck and filth, Mike's sin, to rescue him. And rather than turning that in on himself with self-pity and loathing, it turned Mike out into the world to share this amazing news and live a grace-filled life. There's a phrase that Christians often say that goes something like this. You are much worse than you think you are, but you are much more loved than you realise you are. That's the truth of the Christian life, where God's judgment of our sin meets us in the love of Jesus, whose arms were willingly outstretched to protect us from it. Like Jesus reminds us elsewhere in the Bible, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. So, those who are sick admit they are sick and will find a cure for their hearts and souls in Jesus. Or where Jesus summarises the parable of the two debtors in Luke chapter 7 by saying something like this, those who have been forgiven much love much, those who have been forgiven little love little. The more we come to realise how sinful we are, the more we will love Jesus because we will have grasped even more deeply how much he did for us at the cross. And so we will live the life that he commands us to live as an overflowing of a grateful heart in awe of our own forgiveness. A heart that will pray for our enemies, that will resist an evil person because seeing ourselves too as evil, our hearts will be less judgmental of them and more compassionate and merciful towards them, just as God has been to us. Longing that they too would know the joy of forgiveness, the free gift of grace offered to them through the death of our Saviour and Lord Jesus Christ. If only we repent and believe in him. Amen. Amen.